we began the lectureship because there was a general impression at DePaul, especially among the students, that there was a bubble hanging over DePaul, isolating DePaul students from the outside world. And we essentially said, uh, we can bring the world to DePaul. came all the way from West Lafayette, Indiana. Dayton, Ohio. It's not every day that this kind of thing uh, comes to DePaul. It's really amazing. Tony Blair is visiting Greencastle today. He'll speak at DePaul University tonight. Standing out here waiting in line, we had a chance to ask them why Tony Blair was such an appeal for them. They said it was an opportunity they couldn't miss. The former British Prime Minister's March 2008 visit to DePaul University completed a circle that began 50 years before. On June 8, 1958, Harold Macmillan, at the time the sitting Prime Minister of Great Britain, delivered DePaul's commencement address. Two of the graduates in the Blackstock Stadium procession that day were Tim Oven and Sharon Williams. I have chosen today as the theme of my address to you who are about to graduate into the world the word interdependence. For it is my belief that this word must be the keynote of the second half of the 20th century if the progress of humanity is to continue. After the diplomas were handed out and the caps and gowns put away, Tim and Sharon went on to get married, have children, and enjoy happy and successful lives. Strong supporters of their alma mater the ovens generously and consistently gave back to DePaul over the years and in the mid-1980s made a gift that was designed to provide opportunities for the university community that would be distinctive and unique, a lecture series unlike any before it. Tim's idea, as I understood it at the time, was to provide enough money to DePaul to bring internationally known speakers to the campus and to be able to demonstrate that uh, important conversations go on in Greencastle, Indiana. Oven Lecture Series in general it just allowed us to, as a DePaul student to connect with some of the great speakers, some of the great people of the current times. I mean, it's, it's given us an opportunity to hear from, to learn from, and to interact with people that we otherwise would not have an opportunity to do so. With lectures such as the talk by Dr. Farid Murad, the 1998 winner of the Nobel Prize in Medicine and a 1958 graduate of DePaul, the Oven Series has also showcased the contributions alumni have made to the world. More recently, students heard from 1983 graduate Jim Alling, the president of Starbucks Coffee International. All told, the guests have included eight prime ministers, seven presidential candidates, seven cabinet members, six Nobel Prize winners, and one first lady. All have been presented free of admission charge for everyone to enjoy. It's always really cool a week after, two weeks after, two months after, <laughs> to hear people still talking about those talks. And it's a great asset that DePaul has held on to. It was just after 9-11, just after the World Trade Centers, and I was in Dr. Bottom's leadership class. The October 2001 DePaul visit by former British Prime Minister John Major began with a stop at the Memorial Student Union Building, where he talked with and shared lunch with students in President Robert Bottom's leadership class. Having the opportunity to speak with him in that forum and, and hear from someone not from this country talk about our leaders and how our leaders were handling things in that particular time, which is so poignant in history now, and then him following it up that evening with this fantastic lecture on life in the new world after 9-11 after and talking about global terrorism and, and leadership and what we needed to do as a, as a global society was just a phenomenal experience. The events of September the 11th are about to give us all a master class in consequences. We need politics that confronts the uncomfortable, politics that rises above the short term and the sound bite, politics that is long term and that understands that it no longer controls all the pieces 
on the checkerboard. Jesse Jackson, when he came to campus, was very energized. A lot of people were lining the streets, welcoming him. The December 1992 DePauw visit by the Reverend Jesse Jackson included a speech to thousands in Neal Fieldhouse and a more intimate session with students in Meharry Hall. You know, after the election and hearing that although he had lost, he, you know, the message was that, you know, to keep on fighting for diversity and, and the fact that he was an African-American male um, sort of stood as a reminder that although, you know, as an African-American myself, as, although I'm a minority in the country, um, that doesn't mean that I don't have an opportunity, you know, to one day, you know, to run for office as he did. Great message and something that carries with me today. Black on black crime is deplorable. Black on white crime, white on black crime is deplorable. It's fundamentally an ethical issue, not just an ethnic issue. But the way I mind the program, if, if a white harms a black, it's time to riot. If the black harms a white, it's time for execution. If blacks harm blacks, it's kind of a permissive zone. And that leaves blacks unprotected by law to criminals. We must stop people from killing people no matter who they are and how they look. That's the ethical high road that we must pursue. Peyton Manning filled the auditorium, Mike Krzyzewski did. Those were fun. They were both very well received. I would put those under the, the fun category. And that's a good thing. I'm only a football player, but I am a football player who cares and one who is committed to making a difference. And I'll leave you today with the words of someone whose name I do not know, but whose thoughts I think everyone here should consider. Risk more than others think is safe. Care more than others think is wise. Dream more than others think is practical. And expect more than others think is possible. Thank you very much, and God bless you. I think he, br he brought a lot of messages that were really interesting, especially from a standpoint of, uh, of our athletes, um, because a lot of things that he's saying, we're saying as coaches all the time. Uh, but when you hear it from him, for some reason, the exact same thing sounds a little bit different. When I heard that I had an opportunity to speak to this group, you know, it excited me. And it's because of the excellence that the school has. Take advantage of it get involved and when you finish here keep getting involved add depth to what you're doing you'll be so darn happy and then when you accomplish something and you jump for joy and you turn around there'll be another person to hug a lot of people today they just want to jump for joy and there's nobody there because they haven't taken advantage of building teams. Thanks for allowing me to share some time with you tonight, and Godspeed, and let's both have, uh, let's beat Wabash, all right? All right, thank you. A Democratic presidential candidate is trying to stir up support here in Indiana. Retired Army General Wesley Clark spoke at DePaul University tonight. First on Fox tonight, Jessica D'Onofrio is live in the newsroom and tells us how he's giving President Bush some tough competition. In the presidential race for less than a week, General Wesley Clark has drafted... Perhaps the lecture I remember the best was uh, when Wesley Clark came during his presidential run. Students were there to learn and to hear what he had to say, to question what he had to say, and to grow and develop themselves. Just six days after announcing his candidacy for the White House, General Wesley Clark attracted thousands of people and the national media to DePauw for his oven lecture. He was saying, each one of you in the audience, all 2,700 of you, have the opportunity to change the world in your own way. Schools like this are really the heart and soul of America because you're participating in an educational experience here that prepares you not only for your employment, but for the kinds of citizenry that we need to protect this country, to keep it strong, to keep it free, and to keep it safe in the future. Shimon Perez came to DePauw uh, about one year after Itzhak Rabin was assassinated in Israel and security was very tight. I can remember to this day watching him walk into the Walden Inn preceded by 
two handsome Israeli Secret Service men, each carrying a violin case, followed by two others, each carrying a violin case. And believe me, there weren't any violins in those cases. It's an odd thing to pull up at 125 Wood Street and see a soldier in your front yard with a machine gun, uh, but uh, are heavily armed. And that's what happened when uh, Shimon Perez was here and you had the uh, uh, Israeli uh, people protecting him. He's one of our favorites because I asked him at Bottoms House to take us around the Middle East. He went country by country by country, Lebanon, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and so forth, and talked about each one of those countries and their influence on the region and certainly on Israel, and it was, it was absolutely fascinating. The main thing uh, he brought was, of course, his intellectual and emotional assessment of the problem of peace in the Middle East. This is a season for peace, for enabling people to improve their economies, and they can do it by education, by science, by opening their markets, by opening their minds. And what happened in the Middle East is simply a demonstration what can be done in a most complicated story. I pray that you and us will use the years to come to continue determinedly, without any fears and any doubts, to enable the other half of humanity to enjoy peace and affluence and prosperity. And then we shall be true to our basic values as human beings. Thank you. We all preceded his speech uh, with a dinner at Dr. Bottom's house on uh, Wood Street. And I was one of the first ones into the dining room. And Dr. Bottoms was seated on one side and Shimon Perez was across the table from me. And again, these two gentlemen Tim was talking about, very handsome young Israelis, also acting very superior and said to me, how do we pull these draperies? They were at the end of the dining room and I said, well, those are purely decorative and they don't pull. And they said, well, when the shooting starts, get under the table and tell people to follow you. <laughs> Not if the shooting starts, but when the shooting starts. That made an impact on me. That made me say, okay. Britain's former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher told a crowd at DePauw University this century is ending a lot better than it started. For proof, Mrs. Thatcher points to the defeat of dictators, the breaking up of the Soviet Union, and the crumbling of communism. She was probably the best prepared of any speaker who came to DePauw. She allowed, invited me over uh, when she landed in Indianapolis. We rode in the car together. We had private time, just the two of us. Uh, and I was amazed at her knowledge of DePaul. She had really done her homework. She took the oven lecture series seriously, and uh, I appreciated that. I think she knew more about DePaul history than I do. People lined the walk, and it, it was fun. You know, we've, we, it made me feel like a celebrity, and even though people had come, of course, to hear Margaret Thatcher. It was for me a great honor to be asked to come and address people of this very famous university which has a reputation for excellence because excellence is the only standard worth striving for and its achievement applauds not only those who reach it but it pulls up standards everywhere else. Over the years, DePaul University has hosted several distinguished speakers at its lecture series. And that includes former Secretary of State Colin Powell and British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. 24-Hour News 8's Debbie Knox is joining us now with more on a visit today by the former Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. I think this is the first time we've had a Russian, and particularly a Russian world leader, uh, come to the DePaul campus. I think it's very important that he came Americans have so many misconceptions about Russian culture and Russian politics and particularly after the Cold War and after the Reagan years. 
Uh, well, Mikhail Gorbachev came to Nepal and it was an absolutely awesome event. Probably three or 4,000 people in Lille. My recollection of Mr. Gorbachev was how approachable he was, how friendly he was. Uh, I don't know what I expected, but I didn't expect the warmth. This concerns the entire world, the entire planet. If some of us think that the three billion people who live in extreme poverty should be of no concern, that's a big mistake. And if we continue to make that mistake, we will see, we could see disastrous consequences. And therefore, I believe that this thought of President John F. Kennedy should be applied internationally. We can only have a common future, a future for all or no future at all, as President Kennedy said. Thank you. The war is a major issue in American politics, and he had come back from being the, the number one civilian authority for the provisional government, and I think it was fairly early after he got back. Um, I think he left Iraq perhaps in July, and we had him here in September, so it was special. This was a guy who had, had made history. With us, the former presidential envoy to Iraq, Ambassador Paul Bremer. When you talk to some students, uh, this is the Banner Graphic newspaper in Greencastle, Indiana, where you went to DePaul University. At DePaul Student Forum, Ambassador Bremer admitted, quote, the same Bremer makes the comment in the student forum about needing more troops and how he had articulated that message to the president. I ran back to my office, put it in a web story that uh, I added to later that night after the lectureship. All of a sudden, this little comment that was made in Meharry Hall was a campaign issue. That's one of the remarkable things this series does. Uh, it, it does contribute to the national dialogue. Your generation, speaking now to the undergraduates, is challenged just as the older generation was challenged in 1945 and 1946 and 1947 to a long-term difficult struggle. I have every confidence that America will meet that challenge. Thank you. Paul Rusevichita reflects the kind of person you want to be as a human being, how you treat people, how you interact with them. Um, and the fact that Oven was able to bring him here um, really reflects that Depop respects the whole package, the whole person. He, he was an immediate presence. Uh, he was a hero. And whenever our students and faculty and staff can be in the presence of a hero, uh, that makes it very special. What we need from you is what you, what you did about 20 years ago and less for South Africa. The whole world should get up, get up and help us solving our problems. And solving problems is to bring people back to the negotiating table, let them talk and come to a compromise, come to peace. People need peace. And as long as those Western superpowers are still maneuvering, peace will never come. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, I can assure you that if you want, you can make it. If you want, you can make a difference. If you want, you can help. Not only by giving food, but also by solving problems. Thank you very much. Thank you. In our day to day, we have the opportunity to make the right decision. That was probably the most powerful part. I don't know why I did, because I was so nervous. But I walked up to him and just said, thank you. Um, and he said, well, thank you. I'm not usually surprised, but when Colin Powell stepped out of his limousine, he's 
very large man, he stuck out his hand and said, good evening, Mr. President. And I just kind of wilted. I, I was not the Mr. President he was used to addressing on a daily basis. He made another measurable impression on DePauw because he was just coming off his service as uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff head. I think I asked some questions like, uh, the most famous person you have met and the most uh, important thing that happened in your life. Everybody asks him those questions, but you're just sort of in awe to be sitting right beside Colin Powell and hearing his answers. He got a standing ovation walking in and walking out, as many of the speakers have, because they made such an impression. It brings people like that, people who seem so untouchable to students, to us young, you know, 18, 19, and 20 year olds who see faces and names and, and images and personas on television and in mass media, but to really have access to people like him, it was um, quite inspiring. Since Richard Lamb, Colorado's governor at the time, delivered the first Ubin lecture on November 15th, 1986, 75 other national and international leaders, thinkers, and authors from Ross Perot, Spike Lee, and Doris Kearns Goodwin, to Bob Woodward, Billy Brant, and Benazir Bhutto have come to DePaul as Ubin lecturers. What will we be at that extraordinary moment of time when the huge ball drops and the year 2000 lights up the winter sky? Will we be prisoners of the mindset of the past? Or will we be liberated to the possibilities of a historic future. For our generation, the first in recorded history is fundamentally empowered with the control of its own destiny. I think that DePaul's really got um, a treasure in the, in the Oven Lecture series because it brings people like that, people who seem so untouchable to students. It's not the opportunity to see someone, it's the opportunity to learn from them. Well, I think we have matched what Tim's hopes and dreams, his and Sharon's were, in that we've had such outstanding people. Uh, my only reservation about the series is it's been so successful, I think students kind of come to expect that things like this happen on all college campuses, and of course they do not. Not the accessibility students have had to our speakers. Well, I think DePaul is uh, in a community where there's not a lot of opportunity to uh, on its own to have uh, cultural events of this magnitude. So at DePaul it's very important to have uh, this kind of series. Not only do, uh, does the gift, the generous gift of the Evans, uh, permit us to bring big name speakers to campus, but it also frees up an awful lot of money for speakers who may be just as interesting, uh, just as important in their own right, but who are not a uh, household name. But not many schools have this opportunity to do both. And I think the thing that makes this place special is the, because of things like the, the series and, and, and alums and, and um, people who support the university like, like the ovens, that's what makes it special because the world comes to us. But actually I did have the opportunity of reading a bit of Harold Macmillan's speech at DePaul in 1958, 50 years ago, almost 50 years ago to this day actually. And he spoke then about the interdependence of the world. And he spoke then about the need for America and Britain to realize the world as it was after the post-war years was not going to be the world as it was, as it was going to be in the years to come. And he was absolutely right. And what has happened today in the year 2008 is that this idea of interdependence that was a sort of political cliche has actually come to fulfillment. We are interdependent today. No one country is strong enough, not even this country, powerful and great though it is, is strong enough to be able to handle and to meet the global challenges that we face on its own.
generally speaking, uh, we think we've made a significant impact on Dupont, and it's certainly been rewarding for us too. And I would like to thank DePau University for inviting me to speak here. And I'm really grateful that I'm speaking at a platform where so many incredible figures have spoken before. And then cool things, what other cool things have I done? Talked at DePau University. <laughs> <laughs>